Hey, how are you? Hi, Ken. Um, so uh, this is an interview with Kenneth Lightfoot. Kenny, why don't you introduce yourself beyond just your name and tell us who you are and um, a brief kind of uh, explanation of how um, how you and Boulder relate. I owe, I owe Boulder a lot of money. I, I am still paying paying off Boulder right now. I just the money is ridiculous. That's why I leave town most of the time these days. Don't really stay stick around too long because you know if I stay too long, then they'll just come and get the money off of me. So, what do you owe the money for? Uh, I've been entertaining in Boulder for quite a few years, and uh, they think I I owe them something more than just uh, entertainment. Huh. So, like taxes, or so, is there a permit you have to? No, no. They just, you know, they just want everything out of you. They want your, just not just money. It's blood and guts and everything. They just don't. You know, <laughs> they just don't. I don't know. Just, so, like, I try to avoid it these days. So, uh, okay. Well, we won't get into that anymore, then, because okay. we don't want the cops showing up. But, um, do you? Um, why don't you just start from the beginning? How, how did you come to? Be in Boulder, and what year was it around that you yeah, got Yeah, that's here? a good question. I don't remember remember the year, uh, um, but I was in San Francisco, and a guy who was in the bouldering, uh, rock climbing, told me about Boulder and said there were performers here. So I said, "Well, let me give that a try." And so one day I showed up, and and it seemed to click. Um, at the time, I think it was uh, most of the magicians, which I do. We're working little kids pit thing where the rocks are. You now they, not too many rocks, just big boulders there. Um, and, and Johnny Fox was there. Okay, and um, what were you doing in San Francisco before you came? I was street performing. Yeah, yeah, I was down performing in San Francisco. That's where I started performing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so I want to get the whole history of that, but. Um, well, why don't we just start with that? How did you come to be a performer and a magician? Um, I was, I was, I was in high school. I was interested in in, in magic to a certain degree, or actually, um, I was sort of like the. I used to gamble in high school, play blackjack mainly, mm -hmm. and from that I got interested in cheating at cards, and uh, and from that I ended up. Uh, getting into magic. Because sleight of hand. Yeah, yeah, because it's the related fields, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> yeah, so oh. and then I... Um, did you learn from anybody back then, or did you just no, pick it up totally from books? No, I was self-taught. I've always been self-taught. Mm -hmm. never really learned from, not really um, a social person. Mm -hmm. um, don't really talk to people. You're lucky I'm talking to you. Um, <laughs> so... <laughs> I am lucky. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, I was totally mainly uh, from books initially. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then um, uh, I just I'm very I was always been a bookaholic to a certain degree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, you were back east. Yeah, I grew up in Pittsburgh. So I um, and one day I decided to move uh, west. I went to Las Vegas actually because I became wanted to become a professional gambler. Mm. And that lasted about uh, six months before I lost everything. And then I went to um, Monterey, California, where I had an aunt. And she put me up, and then from there I went up to San Francisco and saw street performers. So how old were you when you went to Las Vegas to gamble? Uh, I was 21, 22, yeah. And um, so how was that <clears throat> to kind of take that plunge and lose everything and then... All the lifestyle started, I think it's, my lifestyle pretty much started pretty early because I had never held a, a job per se for much longer than um, three months at a time, I think, because I was always had a vision of somewhere else, I wanted to be a gambler, I wanted to be a magician, so it was always, um, and then going to Vegas and surviving by gambling for six months before losing everything was sort of still the same lifestyle. So the lifestyle didn't really change. It was, you know, figuring out using your head or your skills to mm -hmm. uh, make a living. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's 
still exists that way. Mm -hmm. Just not gambling. Right. Um, so I had a question about, so you never had a job. Well, and I had you started small to, jobs at yeah, certain times, yeah. Right. So you just, did you ever think about doing anything else besides being a magician or a perf Um, well, I, I, I think, uh, yeah, I thought of other things, uh, but mainly it was, um, like I didn't grow up in a really rich family, so two of my uh, four brothers, four, one sister, three brothers, mm -hmm. and so I figured that my father couldn't afford to put me through college, mm -hmm. so I figured, so the oldest went to college and the youngest went to college, but the two brothers in the middle, which is me as being one of them, didn't go, so. Mm -hmm. I figured I'd just figure it out on my own. And it wasn't that I had this great desire to go to college, except for that's where all the pretty girls were. Um, mm. It was, so I was, I don't know, it just mm. worked out that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, you you weren't necessarily pining to go to college, or it sounded like you had another track anyway. Yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. initially I knew I wanted to, before, I, I knew I was one of, was interested in magic and and also um, uh, gambling at a at a relatively early age, and that's where I wanted to, to give it a try. Let's pause for one second. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so you were in San Francisco. How long did you just tell us a little bit about performing there and how long you were there and what did you learn? <laughs> uh, what that... did you learn and um, I actually, literally, that's where I started performing. That's, um, I hadn't performed, I had studied, uh, magic before then, but I had not, and I had done tricked for, like, children in the neighborhood and, and, um, and passing in, in Pittsburgh, but I had never actually performed. Um, and I had done, tried to do a show in Monterey, actually, Carmel, Carmel, um, in, San, in, uh, near Monterey. And uh, the cops stopped me from performing there. On the street? Yeah. Uh, so I ended up in San Francisco. Um, and this is in the 80s? Yeah. Okay. Um, and just trying to make it in San Francisco. Um, and there was a place to... Um... I also arrived with a, um, a bird, um, mainly... Um, I had the idea of doing a show with with uh, cups and balls, which is a famous trick from magicians, uh, where you produce. I think Johnny Fox used to do it, or still does do it. Uh, where you produce balls and stuff and big objects underneath cups. But I wanted to produce birds from underneath cups. Uh, and so when I was in living in Las Vegas, I was still working on a show with. Uh, a magic show and I was and I had got a bird or actually got two birds because um, I was um, trying to well was what kind of bird love birds um, and so I started working with them and training them and learning how to deal with them they they're too aggressive for producing underneath the cup so I never did that uh, but that's when I started so when I arrived in San Francisco I arrived with one bird um, what happened to the other one uh, one of them I gave to a girl uh, that I was crazy about uh, in Monterey. Okay. Uh, don't know, never know what happened. She wasn't crazy about me, so. <laughs> <laughs> so you wound up in San Francisco, and, and was there, did you say there was a place to perform there? And were there already performers? And yeah, did you kind of interact with them at all? Performing. San Francisco is very famous for performing. Uh, Whereabouts? Uh, Fisherman's Wharf area is the main area. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, you can perform in other areas in San Francisco, but the main area is Fisherman's Wharf. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I basically performed in Jefferson Street, which is the main drag of. Um, and, and so that's where I started performing, uh, literally. Um, doing little close-up tricks and stuff, and trying to define my who I was. Mm -hmm. And um, did you, who did you admire? 
in terms of performers there at the time? Well, there's a guy named the Butterfly Man. It was uh, Robert Nelson, is what his, his actual name is. Uh, and he was a juggler, and he was probably one of the more legends of uh, in San Francisco. He worked for Pier 39. So he was a big, he was one of the big acts. Um, Magician-wise, I had actually, when I was in Monterey, I had run across another magician who was from San Francisco uh, named H.P. Lovecraft, which is obviously a, a took a writer's name. Uh, he did a medicine show, but... A what show? Sh a medis medicine show. A uh, medicine show is where is an old thing that they used to do back um, in the early part of the uh, uh, 19th century and probably in the early part of the 20th century where a wagon would come up in some in different cities and the guy would pitch uh, elixir like a special elixir that would make you do something for you mm -hmm. I don't know what the uh, variations on that I think there was a movie um, the Keith Ledger I think his last movie mm -hmm. was is basically that type of thing um, mm -hmm. I forget the name of the movie though mm -hmm. um, so what did this guy do he just kind of he did it like Magic, but yeah, in that magic. Kind of sense. It was a very tight routine, <clears throat> uh, really well done. Mm -hmm. In fact, I when I first saw him, he was I saw him at uh, Monterey County Fair because I was um, there, and I um, and he was um, he wasn't doing a show at the time, but I went up to him and told him I was a magician and I wanted to do the street type thing, and he was really friendly and he said, "Oh, come back to see my show," mm. and. Um, and so uh, uh, later on that day, I came back to see the show when it was playing. And I was so devastated by his skill and how well he, his presentation, that I couldn't even talk, go up and talk to him. It was like, geez. Um, um, I mean, obviously, he's, yeah, I think he's still around, but he's down in um, Florida. I think he works for Disneyland or something like that now. So how did you recover from your devastation? Well, you just, I mean, I'm very critical about what I, what I wanted to be. So um, I've always been critical about my level and how um, I'm never satisfied with my, with what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. So it made me, it just pushed me to uh, try to be better. But still you had to, that was before I actually went to San Francisco when I saw him. And, um, oh, and this I, was before you had yeah, moved yeah, there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, um but at the time, at the same time as I was in, um, trying to do a show in, in Carmel. Mm -hmm. um, so going up to San Francisco, I uh, started working out there and there was a couple other magicians working the streets. At the, no, there was one magician, his name was uh, Brian Bloodworth. He was sort of like a student of Cellini. Cellini was a famous street performer, magician. Um, he died recently, a few years where, ago. Where was he performing? In the United I had States? never seen Cellini, actually. I just saw a lot of his students. Mm -hmm. um, I met him. He actually was at the, the first time I ever met him was at the uh, a busking festival in Denver that used to take place a few, you know, like 15 years ago or something like that. I can't remember. Mm -hmm. um, so, But I had heard, of, heard about him. And mm -hmm. so I'd seen a lot of his students. So I'd seen his, basically I've seen Cellini's show. Mm -hmm. before I saw Cellini, mm -hmm. because some of his students were doing his style of uh, magic. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he was also a friend of uh, Johnny Fox. I think actually, I believe Cellini had actually performed in Boulder before. Mm -hmm. I think um, mm -hmm. he might have been the first one to actually work the pit. Mm -hmm. And then Johnny, because of that, Johnny started working the pit as well. Really? Yeah. Okay. As a magician. I mean, obviously the kids were working the pit. How did Cellini but... find his way to Boulder? Well, he was a street performer, so whatever, you know, you get to give your ear out. And, mm. and he also did um, cups and balls just like Johnny Fox did. Mm. So, uh, mm. so um, yeah, so I heard, had heard about him, and then I saw this guy. He was um, with, and he was, he had been doing it for a while, um, at least a couple of years, and he, and he had been practicing for quite a while. And so we used to trade off, and then another uh, performer who was actually from... Um, used to trade off? Trade off means that we used to work the same spot. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, another performer named Jeff Edmonds, who was 
also from Colorado, um, who I'd never met, but I met him in San Francisco. And he's basically based out of uh, Aspen, Colorado. Mm -hmm. uh, he showed up. He's so a magician, juggler? He's a magician as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Actually, he is a juggler as well, but he's, his main thing is a magician. Mm -hmm. um, and so we, we hit it off. He was, so he was, uh, so it was the three of us, and then there was a few others, uh, like Fast Eddie was another magician, and another guy, I forgot his name. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was, and we were all, like, relatively n new to the game mm. um, of street performing. Mm -hmm. And so we started hanging out and developing our skills mm -hmm. as performers. Mm. All of us had already been, uh, had skills as magicians in terms of, um, well, yeah, Brian had a lot of more experience in terms of his was a different style. And Jeff had worked um, uh, Aspen for quite a while, working inside restaurant work. Mm -hmm. I was the one who hadn't performed really much in front of uh, people at that time. How was that for you to, I mean, did you just, <clears throat> what did you learn there mostly? What was the... Uh, first, you had to get over your fear. Yeah. And that seems like a lot of people who see street performers say, oh, I couldn't do that. Yeah. Because there's a fear of just being out. I mean, some people say uh, that the uh, number one fear is uh, public speaking and the second one is death. So I don't know, you know to me. So I don't know. Um, mm. So it was getting over that fear. So it was initially I was just like shaking. Mm. You know, you're performing, you're like this. And like, mm. and people, you know, you're young and so they ignore it. So you see it. And I've seen other performers do the same thing. You know, young ones that started out. Mm. You always see that, oh, okay, here I go. <laughs> And after a while, you get, you know, comfortable with it. Mm. And so, um, um, yeah, so you just started developing and trying to figure out what style and how to, what works, what doesn't work. You have all these ideas. Most of it you throw out. And mm. some things you, so many jokes I forget that I've never, you know, um, <laughs> you figure out who, what your style is. Mm -hmm. How would you describe your style now at this, you know, point? Um... Well, a lot of it uh, was still similar to what I initially started. I was one who would, uh, would make, a lot of times, uh, it's a comedy magic show. Mm -hmm. um, and you would make mistakes. In my show, I would look like I was making mistakes. And then I would, I would um, come through. Mm -hmm. But at the beginning, a person who doesn't have the confidence as a performer, people will walk away when you, you come across that way. Because mm -hmm. they think, oh, it's sucks let's get out of here <laughs> and you still get that every once in a while because you're on the street because mm. you still have that stigma of being on the street if you were well, if you were good you wouldn't be on the street mm. mm -hmm. it's yeah so i was yeah go ahead um yeah there's and there's a guy who's famous he's sort of like the david blaine or not really the david blaine but he's like there's a well, david blaine started that street magic type theme if you know who david blaine is okay. um uh, well, it was David Copperfield doing illusions, and it was David Blaine that started on television doing like street tricks in front of a camera. And he wasn't a street performer, but that's mm -hmm. what he did. Mm -hmm. So there's a big thing of that now. Chris Angel in the United States, um, Darren Brown, and um, Dynamo, who's also in. Um, so it's like because you're, even though these people aren't street performers, but because they are doing it on the street, people think of them as street performers mm -hmm. so a lot of times you get up to people come up to you and say oh are you I bet you're not as good as you know dynamo and it's like well uh i i know dynamo he doesn't he couldn't do what i'm doing on the street <laughs> so. so what does it <clears throat> what's the differentiating quality of street performing compared to what dynamo does uh well at this point it's i mean uh, i mean we've evolved to such a point in, in with the media, it's such a surface, everybody's into such a surface mentality. Um, so if you come up with a big, you know, camera set of people with lights, cameras, and, um, and, and microphones, then people, and start doing tricks, then people are just, oh, I'm going to be on TV, so it's not even, mm. it's not even, it's not even the same, it's almost like, it's, 
people want to be famous. Mm. They want to be, they want to be, you know, mm. Mm. so it's a whole different thing. It's almost, oh, he's on TV. So I, I and he does it on street and I'm in his thing. So I'll be on TV. It's just like when you see an interview, some people, people waving behind, mm -hmm. Hey, I'm on mm -hmm. TV, mm -hmm. that type of thing. Um, so it's, it's a weird, I don't know. Can you describe, um, well, let's just, uh, well, I'll ask a question cause it's in my head, but can you describe what it's like to call a show to get people to come and watch or and start a show mm. or make a show or whatever. Mm -hmm. Um, each person has a different style. Yeah. Everybody's got their own little style of doing that. And it's also the, for performers who've never done it or who want to, it's always, it's always the first thing that they have to struggle with. And even, even today, it, yeah, depending on it's, it can be a, a strange thing. Um, so each person has a different style. Uh, a lot of jugglers, most jugglers tend to get, be really large, very ener energetic, like, oh, this is, and very confident. This is going to happen. This is about to happen. And uh, because of that confidence and after experience doing that, then it, it tends to work most times. Sometimes it doesn't, but most times it'll work. Um, oddly enough, people are very primal. Um, ultimately, people are primal. So uh, things like fire will attract the crowd. It's like it's something that goes, I don't know. So we still have that aspect to, to us from when we were living in caves that we somebody has fire, we, we are attracted to it. So uh, they, so that's one of the easiest ways is to have fire or, or anticipation of fire. Mm -hmm. um, hmm. Other big props, uh, which makes it easier for a lot of jugglers because uh, unicycles and big ladders are big things that look interesting, that look like something's about to happen. Mm -hmm. um, colorful costumes or a costume in general, something that looks like you're going to, um, you look different or you look, you look like you're, you're in show business. Mm -hmm. I help. Uh, you still have to have the confidence, but that still helps those things put together, uh, mm -hmm. help. Um, what works for you? Uh, I, I, I've, I've never went that way. Uh, and that's, it's even more so that now than it was back then, uh, because, um, now everybody wants to, you have to distinguish yourself. It was like Circus du Soleil all of a sudden started putting everybody in costumes. So you have to look like you're artistic. Um, uh, for me, I don't, I don't like to yell. I don't, I never did. Uh, so I started, I start small. Um, not always, but I, I do, um, I do these days, most cases, unless I'm doing a festival or something like that. Um, just with a few card tricks. Uh, you get, but the thing is, is getting those first few people. Um, so you got to get a couple people. Most people are judging. There's back to the primal thing. Uh, strictly back to the primal thing is that most people don't want to be the first to stop. They don't want to be even if they see, if they look like, oh, he's doing a. They don't want to be the first people to stop. They don't want to. Um, Want to validate? Uh, I think they call it validating. So if there's two, a few people stop and they're saying, "Oh yeah, well," and then other people come over and, and join in as well because those people stopped. <laughs> so once you get the first two or three people, mm. um, especially if they're a mixed group, in terms of when I say mixed group, um, a man and a woman, uh, a child, a man, a woman, or family, mm -hmm. or something like that. Um, it's better if it's just small little children, then the adults will, will tend to stay away a little bit because they're like, mm. um, they'll say, oh, this is for kids mm. or, or above this. Or, or I've seen even um, people send their kids over but stay in the distance, mm. Mm. which I think may be a primal uh, thing because back in the day, um, though you might not want to, uh, the, I mean, who, who, who am I to their kid? I could be some psychopath. So, uh, so they're like testing. So if I don't kill the child, then it's okay. And mm -hmm. I don't know. <clears throat> Very subconscious. Mm -hmm. Well, here's the, th here's the, th the, th the thing is I, I, and I thought that 
maybe this is true. Uh, well, back in the day, uh, people owned their children. Like you, you could farm, you wanted a bunch mm -hmm. of kids so they could mm -hmm. work, the, work the farms. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it was a good thing to make a lot of kids. But just going even farther back, uh, a lot of things, food, foods that you ate or, or when you explore, were not, um, you didn't know if they were safe or not because it was mm -hmm. something new. Mm -hmm. So the easiest way is just to send your child, see if that child survives. And if he does, then hey, we got something going. So I think children are some of the unsung heroes that people haven't given the credit they they did they deserve. Mm. But that's that's what I'm saying that people are not <laughs> the first ones. So I mean, nobody wants to be the first one. Right. Right. Um, and so it's that whole primal aspect that people oh, there's some other people then. So the bigger the crowd, the more you're validating yourself. So mm. it's like oh, this is this guy must know what he's doing mm -hmm. because he's got a big crowd, whereas somebody down the street doesn't. Mm -hmm. uh, so. And then you do you get louder as the crowd grows and start to address everybody? And uh, you have to talk to them. Uh, the biggest problem with Boulder, and um, one of the reasons I don't perform here that much, is because in most places in other countries you can use a microphone. Mm -hmm. And I've always had a softer voice than a lot of performers. That's mm -hmm. one of the things about performing is that you have to you have to communicate to everybody, and the bigger the crowd, you have to communicate to them. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times. Um, yeah. Um, because of the subtleties in my show, mm -hmm. um, you, I can't, it's hard to deliver them with, when I'm screaming out. Mm -hmm. Obviously it's not, if you're in a theater you can get the reverberations, the theater's made for that to a certain degree, even if you're not mic'd up. Um, but in the street, it just evaporates into the distance, so you have to, the bigger the voice, the better mm -hmm. it works. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. Um, why don't you just uh, so so you were working in San Francisco for a while and then you heard about Boulder and you decided to check it out and what happened? Did you stay here? Did you just come and go? I came for a season and then I went back. Uh, I used to start going between Boulder and San Diego, mm. so I would I would be once again laying the groundwork for what I still do now. Um, How was the first the season uh, in Boulder? How was that for you? Uh, it was good enough to come back. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't great, but it was good enough to come back. And um, and at the time, it was uh, in terms of there weren't as many performers back then. As far as when I say performers, there were always the musicians. There's always musicians, um, but there weren't. It was um, Johnny Fox, me. It was a guy who came up from Arizona named Sean, um, and a few. Jugglers, uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, even uh, Evan from Heaven was working at the time as well. Mm -hmm. and Jimmy and a few other people would come through. Mm -hmm. And um, so, what well, what do you remember about Boulder? What was I like the mountains? You know, mm -hmm. I liked. I li I've always been a person who liked mountains. Uh, I grew up in Pittsburgh, and it was I lived in Pittsburgh's very hilly, not mountainous, but it's like the foothills sort of. Mm -hmm. of uh, the Appalachians, in a, in a sense, so it was always I was always where I grew up was mm -hmm. really hilly. Mm -hmm. um, so I've always been more attracted to the mountains than I have been to the uh, the shore. Mm -hmm. So that's actually uh, I can perform and there were mountains. <laughs> and what about the ambiance of the mall? Did that was it any different from anywhere else you had been, or was there anything special that you? Um, well, it's special. It's special for the United States. It's not special for Europe. Mm. Europe is quite common uh, for this type of situation to happen, mm -hmm. except for the mountains are very special. Mm -hmm. But um, in the United States, there's not too many pedestrian malls that people actually. Usually, the scenario in the United States is that uh, people come into town to work. And then when work is over, they leave and go to back to the respective communities. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Boulder, people come into Boulder to work, and in the evening they stay in Boulder, mm -hmm. and and on the weekends they stay in Boulder. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So because it's because there is like an atmosphere of coming into that area, mm -hmm. and that's true in most, uh, not most, but in most a great deal of the European cities and towns as well. Mm -hmm. And I guess San Diego has that. They have San Diego doesn't have that. Oh, it doesn't. Yeah. It's just a tourist spot. Yeah, San Diego. I only work San Diego on the weekends. Oh, mainly. Okay. 
and that was only in the um, like the park. Uh -huh. So San Diego doesn't have that. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so when did you? So did the, then did you just continue to come every season and leave and come and leave and come? Or? Yeah, I didn't know about the Nywak curse, so uh, and so I ended up coming back constantly. Um, did you ever live here for any? I never lived time? here year round. Mm -hmm. uh, no, I have. Yes, I have. That's right. I haven't lived here year round. Um, once. <laughs> <laughs> So what can you just um let's talk a little bit about buskering and what that means. Busking? What, yeah, busking, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Where does the word come from? Do you know? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not sure. I think it's a European word. Uh much more commonly said in Europe Europe. Uh it wasn't street performing was the main word mm -hmm. in the States for a long time and then people started adopting the the term busking. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of them were using that to distinguish uh uh people who had um, skill from people who were begging or something like that, I'm not sure. Or maybe they were trying to distinguish it from uh, um, that busking is performing and, p and getting paid worth versus um, versus um, just performing. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, so so what what's the lifestyle like and what do you need to you know, what kind of qualities are really essential to be a busker um yeah because they come from all types of backgrounds you know mm -hmm. i'm not i'm not really sure of what uh yeah i'm not well i mean i one time a person came up to me and um was asking about David, the zip code guy. And I, I said that, uh, yeah, he's a little bit eccentric. Uh, and she said, you know, you, all of you guys are kind of eccentric. <laughs> and it, so it dawned on me, you know, I guess we are. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't, some people stick around. I mean, Eddie Ezzard is uh, now very famous. Most people know him now. Uh, he started as a street performer out of necessity. Uh, um, tried all types of things, um, mm. um, and I'm sure a few other people have done it as well. I'm not sure. When you say out of necessity, do you mean that? He, he was... always wanted to be in theater. Mm. I mean, he went to. I think he went to um, Cambridge. Mm. I think it was Cambridge, and he only went to Cambridge from what I read from his thing was uh, to get into theater, and that's the route to get into theater. And then he tried to. Um, and after a while, as soon as he didn't get what he wanted from Cambridge, or he got, or his grades weren't up, uh, he quit that and ended up uh, in Covent Garden, London, mm. uh, street performing, mm -hmm. and working on getting something going. Or actually, I think he went to Edinburgh and tried to produce a few shows, lost money in those shows, Scotland, Edinburgh, Scotland, and um, but met a lot of street performers and then decided to go down to London mm -hmm. and work on a show. Mm -hmm there pays bills mm. and so um, each person it's a it's a it's a th you know I don't like to call it I don't like to call it busking I like to call it not I mean some people are busking but other people I call it theater because mm -hmm. it is theater mm -hmm. and so uh, yeah but it's also moving from place to well, place the, the world depending is a stage. on the <laughs> yeah and what about lifestyle? I, I first I do notice I don't notice a lot of women doing street theater. Um, yeah, yeah, that's true. It's uh, I'm not. I mean, I've analyzed a little bit, but I don't know what the truth is. Uh, it takes a lot of rejection initially, and and guys have that little growing up. There's a little, you know, they. T you can't tease a girl growing up like you tease a guy. Mm -hmm. And so I think because they develop, and still, and that's just a generalization, because most guys can't do street mm. because of that. They don't have that thick of a skin to do street, mm -hmm. the rejection aspect of it, even though they'll try. I think that's more true in, in the culture of women, mm. that if, you, if, if it's pretty harsh, mm. 
um, especially in the uh, the circle acts as opposed to music musicians, which is not in it. Musicians, you don't interact as much. Mm -hmm. I mean, you play and then you don't you don't have to engage. People can appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But uh, with when you have to interact, uh, it's a little bit different. And mm -hmm. so, um, but every girl that I see that does it really well is very aggressive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And 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 they develop an aggressive aspect to it. Um, and you have to. I think. Yeah. And um, what about, I mean, if you're a street performer, how, it, I mean, what are you, um, I mean, is, is it possible to have a family and, you know, kind of do the... Yeah, I know a number of people have families. Mm -hmm. I mean, ultimately people want to, most people want to have families. Uh, and or, travel with the families, do you know? Uh, a lot of the families happen to be performers. Or were performers. If you don't, if you have, a, if you're with somebody who isn't a performer, then that's a little bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. um, that tends to be a little bit more difficult. So mm -hmm. most of the performers I know who have families, uh, the people that they ended up with were actual performers or mm -hmm. artists, and they understand that that necessity. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, hmm. Every once in a while it happens. You get the and sometimes. Um, I think Jimmy, um, his uh, his first wife was, um, I think she was a, a teacher. Yeah, I think she was a teacher. Mm -hmm. um, Jimmy, uh, Chris Gorstrinka, that's his name, started in Boulder. Um, and so she had a regular job, which, and he, he would supplement their income as a performer. Mm. So that worked out for a mm. while. Uh, they ultimately... Uh, broke up, but he ended up together with Kazaya, uh, who used to be a member of Ear Jazz, and she's a, she was a performer. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. so uh, yeah. Right. So it takes a, a certain kind of. Yeah, I mean, there's no set rule, obviously. Right. Run right, across right. whatever. Love is love, yeah. you know. <laughs> yeah. But I do. I just. I just wonder about that because it is this very. It's a kind of a different kind of lifestyle. Yeah. Um, it's For not, most people, it is. Yeah. Yeah. That doesn't sound good. God, that sounds like an old man. Um, okay. Let's see. Let me check my questions. So, um, how has how has your show changed over the years and? Did anything happen in Boulder that, I'm just kind of getting a little Boulder-centric, um, that influenced your show or people you met here or was there a certain vibe at all that happened here or was it just kind of another place to perform? Um, no, I've, I've never been, uh, nobody has influenced my show in Boulder, um, uh, none of the performers um, have had an effect on me. In, in terms of my show uh, in Boulder, because um, usually who influence usually jugglers influence jugglers uh, for the most part, but there's also stylistic things in terms of. Uh, mm -hmm. um, but I've never, I've never see Boulder is a little bit unique in that in a lot of other places um, people tend to steal more material. Like if you go to England, um, in Covent Garden, if, if like uh, people will just, if you come up for new stuff, just oh, I'll, I'll take that. So it's like they they need not as creative. Um, in Boulder, most of the performers were tend to be unique. Mm -hmm. uh, they all tended to be relatively unique, and that was that was nice. Mm -hmm. That was nice. Uh, um, and so uh, yeah, nobody. I mean, and the only magicians, I, I actually influence other magicians just giving them advice and stuff, people that you wouldn't know, um, who had worked Boulder. Mm -hmm. um, like there was a guy who was an engineer, started working the streets at the same time when I showed up uh, developing a show, and he it was good. He was a good street performer. I think it was Mark. Um, 
but I was kept, I critiqued him, mm. gave him mm -hmm. advice, and he would follow that advice and get better mm. as a performer. Mm. So in that way, I influenced him. Uh, Johnny Fox show was pretty much set, mm -hmm. uh, and our styles were completely different. Mm -hmm. And so um, he didn't influence me, and I didn't influence him. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but um, so no, I, I, I um. I um so nothing special about Boulder in particular um did yeah. you did you meet any um what about friends or just general Boulder people um yes yeah, that's, that's um well you meet all types of people I mean that's uh, it goes with the, with the territory mm hmm uh, Boulder. How does Boulder compare with other cities to live in and also just venues to perform in? I guess you already mentioned about the, the um, amplification. Yeah, uh, well when I initially showed up there, there was some amplification uh, hmm. mainly with musicians. Hmm. Um, and I believe there was a, something, Watson and Edge were a, mm -hmm. a group that played. And I think they were one of the main reasons why, um, and another guy who did keyboards amplified, and they sat on one spot in the middle of the court thing and played for long periods of time. And people, a lot of the merchants um, were just tired of listening to the same stuff all the time. And so they banned amplification from the mall, except for um, letting the powers that be put amps on whenever they wanted to. Mm. Um, so I think, and that's that's not uncommon. I've seen that happen in other places um, uh, with musicians. Mm. Uh, most musicians are pretty, I mean, the funny thing about Boulder is that most of the, the performers get along relatively. There's a certain thing, like there's spots for they're not designated spot for the uh, circle acts, the jugglers, the magicians, and stuff like that, but they tend to gravitate to those spots. Mm -hmm. Musicians tend to stay away from the respect, unless there's nobody working there, respect those spots for the, mm -hmm. the circle acts, and they tend to gra gravitate to mm -hmm. other blocks and other areas. Mm -hmm. And so there's a certain unspoken respect. It doesn't always work. I mean, I've seen when it didn't. <laughs> But uh, uh, after a while, you, you know how to deal with it. Or That's nice. Deal with it. Yeah. I mean, that takes a lot of, I don't know. It just seems like that would be a, something I wouldn't like to deal with is like the hassle of like claiming a spot. and. Yeah, yeah. Just, well, in some places, it's not that way. It's whoever gets a spot gets a spot, and then you either hold it or there's a rotation mm -hmm. there's an hour on hour off or, or you can't play in fact that's how they dealt with the uh, amplification thing in other countries or in other cities is that you can only play there for an hour and then you have to go somewhere else mm. and you have to be a certain volume um, and it worked here they just totally got rid of it uh, mm. which yeah, I can't Let's put it that way, I can't develop my show to where I want to go here because of the, the rule on amplification. Mm, mm -hmm. So I tend to go to other places. Yeah. And a lot of the other creative acts that you would never see in Boulder don't come to Boulder because of the amplification. Mm, mm -hmm. uh, every once in a while they had, like a few years back, I think Johnny Fox and some of the council put together a, a busking festival in Boulder. And at that time they allowed amplification, so acts that actually could actually use amplification. What use normally use amplification were allowed to use amplification. Mm -hmm. And so so a lot of it in 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 one sense a lot of really great acts you know you'll never see in Boulder because of the amplification. Mm -hmm. But uh, at the same time it doesn't get overcrowded with performers and um, mm -hmm. yeah. Interesting. So it has a, a unique flavor just yeah, because of, the, of that one rule. Yeah, some of the performers like it uh, be, because it keeps little people away, you know, mm -hmm. other performers away. Mm -hmm. uh, so they like it. And, and those performers, most of the performers, um, 
uh, when I say performers, I'm not talking about the musicians. Mm -hmm. uh, musicians have their own thing, and I'm and and some of them are great, and other ones mm -hmm. are whatever. But I'm I'm usually talking when I say performers, I'm usually talking about the jugglers and magicians and mm -hmm. such. Mm -hmm. um, most of them have a, a good speaking voice. Mm -hmm. I just don't have a good speaking voice in terms of uh, projection. Mm -hmm. So I tend to prefer to go to other mm -hmm. places. Do you have any good Boulder um, performing stories? Mm. Uh, well, they tried to kick me off the mall once because of my bird. Uh, <laughs> Say more. What happened? Um, well, I had I have a. Uh, I don't perform with a bird now, but I had a bird for many years. And, and when I arrived in Boulder, actually, that's there's two stories. Uh, the first time I arrived in Boulder, I was sitting. I knew where the performing spot was, so I was sitting there waiting. Um, um, uh, to perform later on. There was no performance there at the time. I was sitting there waiting. I had my bird on my shoulder and um, and um, a police comes up and asks us for my ID. He says, oh, ID. He says, uh, um, I said, why do you want my ID? He says, because we've had uh, reports of uh, 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 a black guy molesting children or something like that. I don't know if it was a black guy or just a guy molesting mm -hmm. children. I can't remember what it was. I said, well, did the, did the report say he had a, the guy had a bird on his shoulder? He said, no, but that was the first time. And I, up and after that, they took my ID. And after that, I had never had any trouble with them until um, it, a number of years later when they told me that I couldn't have a bird on the uh, mall. Hmm. And, um, or the bird had to... Have a leash on it? <laughs> Yeah, it could only be on the mall when I was perform actually performing, and I had to get a permit to do that. Um, mm -hmm. And I said, well, uh, well, I can't perform here then. Because um, the bird, it wasn't just a, a, a bird. <laughs> oh, can. Go, go.